So slap, here's slap, 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 slap. It's Mystery Maniacs. Mystery Maniacs is a comedy recap podcast dedicated to British mystery TV. Each week we dig into an episode of the show, including Murders, Mayhems, and Loonies, and everything else we love. This week we're covering Father Brown, Season 1, Episode 1, The Hammer of God. And this is the more recent uh, 2013, is 2013, that right? 2013, not Series, the 1974. Not the old Potato version. Vision that was made before I was born. Yep. Though... Those are kind of worth watching if you, I don't know, maybe you take a shot every time you're creepy out. They're in- You'd be real good and drunk by the middle of it, I bet. incredibly strange for 1970s TV. Mm-hmm. It is more like, and people are going to be weirded by this, I would say that show is more like Doctor Who than it is like EastEnders. Wow, yeah. There are Not plot-wise, but the, production-wise. The production and the, the episode that takes place in the strange castle thing oh, with the Americans. Yeah. That is bonkers from start to end, yeah. that episode. Again, go back and watch them if you want to, but I recommend drinks. <laughs> yeah. It'll make it more fun. No, we're talking about the Mark Williams Father Brown. Yes. And I think uh, in a nod to that original Father Brown, that that Father Brown was Kenneth Moore did the act, Mm -hmm. was Father Brown. I think in a nod to that, that's why they did Hammer of God first, because Hammer of God's not the first story. No, and it's a short story. Yep. And so these are written by Chesterton, who was an odd duck too, by the way. Yeah, and this is a response to the Protestantism of Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I would say, it's also a response to the war that's coming because these are pre World War I stories. When they're written. Yeah. Now, these are set in the 1950s. Yeah, I wondered why they did that. I looked, I couldn't find anything definitive from the writers or the producers about that decision. Yeah. But I can only assume that there are a lot of shows set in the 30s in England, the interwar years, the 40s in England, and that maybe they just wanted to shake it up a little bit. I also think, purely as a production situation, that it is harder, like, you can't set these in the teens because the cars that they would have yeah. don't work anymore. Right. Like when And you're frankly, doing- uh, you know, anything before, like, 1949 would be so dark and bleak and sad. Yes. That if they wanted to make a show about a priest and church extravaganza and scones, that they couldn't set it then. And and later on in these episodes, I don't, I'm not sure if it's referenced in any of the episodes that we're going to cover. But he was in the war. He was in the Second World War, and he, he makes reference to that. Father Brown. Yeah. Yes. And so, do we ever learn his first name? He doesn't have a first name, right? He doesn't have a first name in the books. Different people say it's John, but it's just Father Brown. Well, in in these years, you know, one in five men was named John. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But his war backstory, I really like that he had gone through that and he's still like in the second episode that we're going to do, the Apollo episode, it deals with the trauma of war, but it also deals with with. Father Brown not being affected by that trauma. Well, and I think it's an important, this is not fun stuff, but I think it's an important thing to remember that though this is set in 1953, this episode is, every man, every person really, but specifically the men that you're seeing, they have all been at war. All of them. Yeah. The pre, the priest, the reverend, the ironsmith, the biologist, you know, Norman, the jerk face who gets killed, all of them have been to war. Yep. And- all of the women have dealt with rationing and, you know, giving up their country estates to the military and worrying about, you know, spouses and brothers and sons going away. They've all been through that. I love the way that especially this episode really talks about the end of rationing without talking about the end of rationing. They mess up. They do? Yep. Okay. Let's just talk about 1953 before okay. we dive in. There's here. a okay. lot to go on with 1953. We know that it's 1953 because that's what's on uh, Elizabeth's uh, confession when she signs it yes. the day 
date is there. Oh, that boy. it is June. What? 15th is when the murder happens, and the 16th is when she confesses. Okay, so we're mid-June, 1953. And they screw up the day, by the way. It's actually Monday, Tuesday, instead of Thursday, Did Friday. Did you really look but, at the 53 calendar? <laughs> yes, You're I so broken. 1953 calendar. Let me tell you about 1953. It is perfectly set. They do a really good job. Yes. They make one mistake. We'll talk about yeah. that. Well, okay. the day. <laughs> it's... It's interesting that we're talking about this now. Yes. Because 1953, June 2nd, so a week and a half before this happens in this timeline, Queen Elizabeth II was had her coronation. They they should have more bunting everywhere. Well, they would have taken the bunting down a week and a half later. Uh, I don't know. It was a pretty big deal. Yeah, but I would have expected maybe a little reference to it. A reference especially it still would have to been on TV. Top of mine. Yeah. So, and... Everybody knows who's listening, but just in the last day or so, she died. Yes. So it's sad to remember, but this is the year that she had her coronation, which was a big deal. You know, and an unabashed Midsummer fan. Mm -hmm. Like, absolutely loved Midsummer. Oh, Liz? Yeah. Oh, yeah, she liked Midsummer. She loved, <laughs> loved Midsummer. You see lots of pictures of her and John Nettles online. She was a fan. I bet you she watched Father Brown. I bet you she did, too. I bet you she did. Apparently, she liked to take box sets with her when she went away to Balmoral oh, okay. to watch stuff. Okay. So I think she was a binger too. Oh, I think so. <laughs> no. It must be weird. Liz, I love Liz, but can you imagine her watching this episode going, I was coronated like three weeks. Th they didn't even mention she, me. They didn't even mention me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, um, I can't separate Queen Elizabeth now from Russell Howard's impression of her. Well, yeah. <laughs> Every time he jokes about her, he makes her sound so badass. <laughs> And it's a, that impression is done of love. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You have to see him, uh, Russell Howard, talk about Queen Elizabeth meeting Trump. It's so funny. Yeah. So, so funny. Absolutely. So the other things that happened in 1953, in February of that year, Watson and Crick discovered DNA. Yep. So that was a big deal. Casino Royale, the first James Bond book, was released in April. Yes. So just before this. Just a few days after this in June, John Christie uh, was sentenced to death. Christie was a big deal. He murdered his wife and eight other people. Wow. He was sentenced to death and he hung. He was hanged in, Ju in July. Wow. Just a month later. Things are different now. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the mistake they made. Uh, sugar rationing didn't end until October. Oh, okay. So in June, Mrs. M would still be pretty tight. With, the, with sugar. the sugar for her scones. Now, that doesn't mean that she didn't save up enough to do it, but there wouldn't be nearly as many sweets on the table as there would have been before rationing or much or after this. The other thing that happened at this exact time, so in 52, Alan Turing is arrested for being a homosexual. Mm -hmm. Alan Turing, who built the Enigma machine that allowed the Brits to decipher German coded messages and, and, and really change the tide of this World War II. This is when all the Bletchley Park stuff starts to come out. If you haven't seen that show, go watch yeah. it. And then, then 54 is when he's chemically castrated and mm -hmm. is devastated and commits suicide. That also is in the background here. Yeah, I so when say. Philip Walker, the, the entomologist in this episode is confronted about being gay and he's scared, he's got reason to be terrified. Because a major news story is happening every day yeah. about a war hero who we now, who the press now has turned on mm -hmm. because he's homosexual. Yeah, so that was top of mind. Yeah. The other thing is that there were still a lot of police um, Polish resettlement camps in the UK. So Susie lives in the camp. Yep, and they were which all is in an old... It's in an airfield that would have been used during the war. Yeah, those are called Nissen huts. Yeah. And they were invented by a guy named Nissen. Okay. In America, we call them uh, Quonset okay. huts. Yeah. Because that's where they were built in a, on a, in a factory on a point in Rhode Island that's called Quonset Point. Okay. Um, but they're uh, corrugated sheet metal bent into temporary. Yeah. They're... Yeah. But like starting in... 1947, the Polish refugees in the UK were were given rights officially, so they could file for unemployment. They could get jobs without getting special paperwork. They were basically de facto UK citizens all of a sudden. This is a period of great migration. Yeah, all over the immigration and migration all over Europe, especially. Yeah, well, by 1949, a quarter of a million Polish troops were in the UK with their families. Mm. That's a lot of people. Yeah, that yeah, is. A quarter of a million people back then. So that's the world in which 
this episode happens. And they're clearly making reference to all those things. Mm -hmm. And sorry for all the seriousness here, but we just wanted to kind of set that up. We start with the the most unsexy, sexy scene. Oh my gosh. Can we all just agree that Norman should die earlier than he does? Well, I'm (laughs) I'm going to postulate. You want to kill him constantly. I'm going to postulate that his brother is a worse human being than he is. Oh, no, I don't disagree with that at all. Oh my gosh. At least Norman's nasty on the outside. Yeah. The Rev is nasty on the inside. When the when the Rev goes to Father Brown and says, you should accuse this other guy. I'm like, wow. <laughs> oh, when he's happy to have Simeon go to jail? Yeah. Yeah. I think if Simeon had been arrested, none of this happens. None of it happens. No. He no. would have just been hanged and that would have been it. Yeah. And the Rev would have been like, done. Yep. Norman, though, his hypocrisy makes me so angry, which, of course, it's supposed to, right? Yeah. So he's pointing the finger at Elizabeth saying, you know, in the Bible, people who didn't pay their debts were stoned to death. Yeah. Meanwhile, he's blackmailing a married woman to have sex with him and threatening the life of her husband. Yeah. But she's the bad one. Oh, yeah. I just want to slap him. Slap, 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 slap. He is horrendous. So then we get the, the Father Brown titles. Now. The Father Brown titles are in silhouette and is clearly After Effects. It is Adobe After Effects. Well, yeah, that's the software yeah. they would have used. Um, they're beautiful, though. I love them so much. They're beautiful. I they love them. fit the show perfectly. Him on his little bike, and it's just got the little flash of white from his collar and his glasses. That's all it, that's all it takes. You know it's him. So Father Brown is introduced on his bike, and oh boy, let me tell you, I went down a rabbit hole. Well, there are serious bike nerds out there. There are serious bike nerds out there, and I'm going to put two pages in the show notes of arguments over the bike. Over over whether it's right? Yes. Whether or not it should have reflectors on the pedals the way it does, whether or not it should have brakes like that. That's serious minutia. It is serious minutia. My favorite thing about his bike is that it's black. Yes. (laughs) It's It matches his cassock. I had somebody... (laughs) I, I read somebody who went through catalogs and said they couldn't find an all black bike like that at that time. I'm like, wow, you are a maniac. <laughs> you, you think there wasn't somebody who um, made bikes for priests? Yeah, I got to think. Like somebody whose job it was was to give priests spikes and they yeah. painted them black before they gave them to them because they were that made them modest. Oh, like like whole discussions of fenders and chrome and oh my all gosh. of that. Wow. <laughs> just... Needless to say, it is a minimal bike. It is not super fancy. No, no. And then, it's functional. It's how he gets around. And then there's a point in the post where it kind of slows down. And then somebody finds a picture of the bike with just the bike in full view. Uh-huh. And then they are off oh, again. <laughs> How does his cassock not get caught up in his bike? I, I don't know. He should have the little ring thing on his pants. No, too. not his pants leg. His coat. On his his whole cassock, cassock is long. Yes. I almost want him to like bundle it up at his waist and like tuck it into his pockets before he gets on his bike. Because <laughs> I could just keep thinking like, he doesn't really, does he have um, wheel covers? Is there a fender on his back wheel? I think so. Because he would get so much yeah, mud on his yeah, cassock if he didn't. There is discussion of that, but yes. Of course yes. there is. <laughs> And then the bike appears slightly different in the titles. And so there's discussion of the bike in the titles versus for the budgets. Thank you for sparing us all of that. Telling us about how awesome the argument is and not telling us all about the (laughs) argument. I don't think I could handle it. I was I was down that rabbit hole like quite a while. And he so he rides through town. It's a great introduction. Yeah. And then they do a the 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 writing of this is so good because it's like oh we're having a fate in which we two pe- two groups are coming together it's an interfaith extravaganza so everybody has to introduce themselves yes what do you know cuz people don't know yes. each other scones uh, mrs m's award winning strawberry scones yeah. Irri- they irritate me. I, and I'll tell you why they irritate me. I'm fine with her being proud of her scones. Yes. I don't doubt that they would be award-winning, that they were really, really tasty. Yes. They are not the right thing to bring to a pitch in. No. Nope. Because there's eight. There's eight of them. That's plus, all. Plus. It's not enough for everybody. I looked at probably <laughs> 15 scone recipes, mm-hmm. strawberry scone recipes, and nobody does them like she does, where she makes the scone 
cuts it in half, puts strawberries in it and the cream. Everybody puts the strawberries in the scone. Oh, uh, well, the way she makes them is the way you would kind of assemble it yourself. Okay. When you were having tea. Okay. The question is, does she put clotted cream on them or whipped cream? They're, they're yeah. Dun, dun, dun. The, there are people trying to recreate that recipe all over the oh, internet. Oh, wow. It's just a scone with strawberry and cream on it. I love how the words Catholic and Anglican are not said in this episode, but it is everywhere. Oh, they are said. Oh, Because Norman calls them out on their rituals and everything. And yeah. He, he says Catholic, but nobody says Anglican. Oh, I thought he did. Are you oh, sure? I think, oh, okay. I think he does. Maybe. Because I didn't know what Reverend Bohan was until... Okay. He, he may say Church of England. Yeah, he instead. probably says C of E. Mm-hmm. And then, then you're like, oh, scones, and everybody's getting introduced. And then Mrs. McCarthy is the meanest human being on the planet. She's so nasty to Susie. Now, and, and this is something that happens every episode in these early seasons. Mrs. M is nasty, and then she's good at the end. That's she's her character nasty, arc. She's good at That's the end. Th- and then eventually the writers go, maybe she just shouldn't be nasty. Yes. And she still is... Totally gossipy and full of information, but not nearly as nasty. Yeah. But in this first season, she's sexist. She's racist. Oh, she's she, nasty to immigrants. Oh, she's and, just mean so to nasty. kids. Yeah. Like, and then, but but every episode, she redeems herself at the end in some little way that clearly doesn't really count because she's nasty again at the beginning of the next one. Yes. Now I know the the guy who wrote this is named Tassin Gunner, mm-hmm. and he. He's written a couple other shows like old new tricks and stuff like that. But he is a student of all of this. Oh, yeah. Because the clock tower is done. Mm. That is a difference. Like the clock tower has already been funded. They're, oh. not, they're not raising money to get the clock tower. Yeah, but it's, it's already done. It's a clock stuck on the side of a tower. Oh, my. Yes. It's not and, really a clock And in tower. an episode where they did so good with other clocks, mm-hmm. the clock tower clock is bad. Mm-hmm. Father Brown has a pocket watch. It is an Ingersoll Triumph. Okay. Okay. Is this another nerd pit? Oh, boy. <laughs> woo, woo, nerd pit alert. <laughs> so so I have a question. So first of all, the, the hands are painted with the glow in the dark stuff mm. that causes cancer. Radium. The radium stuff. Just so that watch is radioactive. Yeah, but the, the the paint itself is not bad. It's the fact that the radium girls lick their brushes. Yeah, they that's ingested how they, it. That's how they got yeah. it. Yeah. It, it, it's so tiny yeah. that inside the the dial is another set of numbers. So you have a beautiful set of black numbers on white mm-hmm. on the in, on the outside. They're beautiful. It is a gorgeous watch but there's an inner set of blue numbers do you know why no they're the military time numbers and i wonder people in england use military time all the time they don't say the show is on at seven o'clock they say 1900 yeah i I wouldn't say that the majority of uk people use military time on a regular basis but but trains do except for in this episode they don't they say the train is at 2 p.m hmm I think they probably removed the military stuff. Because it's kind of a throwback to the war that everybody wants to stop thinking about. I think it's just more accessible all over the world as a show, if you say 2 p.m. But also in 1953, who wants to be thinking in military time? I could not find that watch. I found watches from that year. I found watches from the previous year. But that watch with the blue numbers inside, it's it must be incredibly rare. Maybe it's a military issue. Maybe it's it could be what he had in the war. Because I found that watch without the blue numbers. Is it a valuable watch? You know, watches are weird. Yeah. You know, I, di- I didn't look at prices, but. So can we talk about the scene where Norman is drinking from straight from the wine bottle? And yes. Making an so ass Norman of drives up in that car, which is gorgeous. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, that's a gorgeous car. <laughs> Here comes the jerk. Where is he driving from? <laughs> I don't know. His estate, the last scene of his being a jerk. <laughs> Which is in their house. Yeah. So, okay. Norman is awful to her, leaves his wallet, goes out to the back of the house. Then drives his car around the block. Drives and pulls his up car at the around the block. Extravaganza. So he's, he's awful, right? He offends everybody standing there. Yes. And then 
Philip says, I don't know. I don't mind Norman. I think it's refreshing. I think he's the one who says it. It may be Father Brown who says it's refreshing. And Mrs. M says, as refreshing as a used toilet. And then she's like, oh, sorry. Yeah. Pardon me. It's like she's possessed for a second. Yeah. It's like, your mother makes scones in hell or something. <laughs> I don't. It just comes out of her. Yeah. It's really weird. It's so crude. Yeah. <laughs> You're just a turd floating around. Like, whoa, Mrs. M. Reel it back, lady. <laughs> She's she's always really offended by anybody who disrespects Father Brown. And she does it all the time. <laughs> it does it's not the same. Yes. Mrs. M has a heart in there somewhere. It, it doesn't always show. It's not but, shown as well in these. But early she episodes. is never disrespectful to him. Now, she razzes him yes. like a sister or a wife yes. or a mother, but she's never disrespectful to him as a member of the uh, of the church. It's very much not a husband and wife. It's very much siblings. Yeah, like them. a nagging older sister more yeah. than anything. Yes. I read a really interesting uh, but very dry article that compared Sherlock Holmes, Hercule Poirot, and Father Brown to Dupont, Poe's original yeah. detective. Yes. And it was really interesting because what they said was that the reason why Brown is different is that Holmes and Poirot are very scientific. Yes. And they look a lot at evidence and they look a lot at the impact that a crime has had on the scene and on other people. But Brown solves mysteries by empathizing with the criminal. And that's really clear in the original story and the He puts himself in the criminal's shoes. Version. Yeah. And his goal is never justice. It's reform and to save their soul. Yep. That's that's clear right from the very beginning. And we joked the last episode that he's the least Catholic Catholic priest ever, mm -hmm. but, but he is concerned for their immortal soul. Well, the fact that he doesn't care that Norman and Philip are gay, yeah, that he lets that go, a Catholic, he, he would have had to say something about it. Like, yes. oh, and that's kind of bad too. But the more important thing right now is this. Yeah. You know, we can talk about that later, but this is more important. But I don't think he ever would have said like, I don't really care about that. So the husband, <laughs> the husband finds the wallet. And th did you notice that prop that it, that wallet, the way it's put together mm -hmm. and he pulls out the Sunny Oaks Golf Club membership card, card. membership card. With Norman's signature. Of course Norman's a member of a golf club. But everything in that wallet is perfect. Yeah. And I really want to point out to the people who did the production specifically on that wallet that is a hero prop shown for one shot. It's good. It is perfect. It's worn in the right places. And Oh, this show's always great about costuming. Yeah. It's great yeah. about props. It's great about sets. Yeah. Because it's only in the 50s. It's not that far back. What did you make, though, of Elizabeth and Simeon's kitchen? It was kind of weird. Did uh, people I was weird. use tools as decoration back then? I don't know. Because to me, that's more of a modern thing. I was weirded out because it's June, and he's working in the in the the forge, and then he comes home for lunch, and he has his heavy wool coat on. Yeah, I don't know why he I'm puts like, that why on. Why do you have your heavy wool coat on? Because the forge is in their yard. And then you feel bad because you feel so bad for her because her husband is also crappy to her. I think he's nice. I think he really loves her. I, I think, think their relationship is good. I think so too, but we're shown that he's frustrated here and he takes it out on her a little bit. But he immediately yeah. pulls it back. Yeah. Immediately. Yes. I think he's frustrated because they're in debt. Yeah. And maybe she's not being sensitive enough to that. And he no, feels guilty no. because the debt is his the problem. The debt is his problem. He is not a perfect man mm -hmm. by no stretch of the imagination. So Elizabeth is being blackmailed by Norman about Simeon's debt. Which is right? 50 pounds, she says later on. Which, according to the inflation calculator I looked at, would be 979 pounds now. Or about 1,700 American dollars. You had a higher number. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Norman has forgiven this debt. What does Simeon, why, what excuse was given to Simeon that the debt was forgiven? I don't know. I don't know. Does because, he think Norman just forgave it out of the goodness of his heart? Because I don't think he would believe that. No, I don't think so either. And they can't say to Simeon, oh, well, I've decided to forgive it in exchange for having sex with your wife. Yeah. That's not going to fly, obviously. Though... He might say something like, I've made other arrangements and touch his nose. Which Simeon would still 
pop him in the face for yes, it. Yes, I think so too. But when I did the math, so Norman has taken advantage of Elizabeth twice and he says two more times we'll do it. Yeah. So four times. Yes. So four divided into nine hundred and seventy nine dollars. <laughs> he thinks she's worth about two twenty five a time. Wow. Like I don't the whole I don't know how to feel about that. On one hand, I'm like, that's incredibly cheap. She's a value. But yeah. on the other hand, I'm like, that's not that much money. They're going to lose their house over owing 50 pounds. I think it's a lot more money to them than we realize. Yeah, I guess. I mean, obviously she doesn't work outside the house and, and he's a blacksmith, which can't be a hugely lucrative thing. But I don't know what it is he's making. He's making a bended stick. I, I, don't, I don't know, know. what he's forging in, that into. This episode needs a discussion of evolution that lasts for two sentences and then <laughs> stops. <laughs> <laughs> we just have to see that Father Brown is respectful of science, that he doesn't reject science. Yep. That's all that scene is for when Father Brown is talking to Philip about evolution. I, I have in my, my, my notes, oh, you poor, smart, liberal, well-dressed gay guy. <laughs> <laughs> I really and don't have time for the fawnings of a sycophant and, right now. And Father Brown, every time somebody says you wouldn't be interested in it, Father Brown says, no, tell me more about it. Yeah, I would be. That is extremely part of his character. Yeah, that he likes to learn. And then we need somebody to scream at dead bodies now and in the future. <laughs> and we have In her. comes Lady Felicia. Lady Felicia. Nancy Carroll has a long history of screaming. Yes, at she things. does. <laughs> Especially in Midsummer and this. Yes, in Midsummer, she was Connie Bishop in The Great and the Good and screamed out of her own window on several occasions. And I, then she was also in Hidden Depths. Yeah, I think she may hold the record for most bodies found. Because she finds so many bodies in this episode, <laughs> in, in this series. Yeah. Uh, oh, and Father Brown, she finds a lot of bodies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, recently, she was in Murder in Provence. Yes, and uh, she's fantastic. With Roger Allen. Yeah. We enjoyed it. Yeah. But uh, I'm not sure. I liked it. There's a lot of debate about it. Like, do you know they're actually supposed to be French people? Oh, okay. They're not I expats. Did, I didn't they're know. They're actually they're French people. French people. Oh, no. They're not supposed to be Brits okay. living in France. They're supposed to be French. <laughs> I don't know if Roger. You'll understand that if you go watch it. I now. don't know if Roger Allen could pull off a French accent and not sound crazy. <laughs> they would all sound so stupid. They'd all sound like Pepe Le Pew, which brings up my next point, which is she mentions Carmen Habanera. Yeah. Because she's going to sing it. Mm -hmm. And that's from Bizet's Carmen. They have a nice string quartet there for they an do. extravaganza. That totally riffs off uh, Banera the whole time. Yeah. They're like, da -da 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 -da. If they learn one not, song for the day. If you're not fam familiar with that music, I'm going to put it, I'm going to put Maria Callas's version of it. In it is iconic. Shona. It is iconic. And you know that music immediately. But Love Nancy is a rebellious word, a bird that no one can tame. But it's Nancy Carroll has a great voice. Yeah, she really can sing. Yeah, it's her introduction in the in the play mm. in the opera, yeah. and it fits perfectly here. I forgot how skinny Nancy Carroll is. Oh, so skinny. She's super thin, and they put shrugs on her and hats on her and dresses on her that try to fill her out a little bit, but she. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not I'm not saying she's too skinny, but I forget she is so thin. So then the, there's a whole bunch of machinations here of people to get create red herrings, mm -hmm. right? So people disperse throughout the the luncheon and the church and everything. And we see Susie arguing with Norman mm -hmm. and we see the scientist arguing with Norman. Philip. Yes, mm -hmm. Philip. I have corduroy, so I must be gay. <laughs> or or an academic. Yes. And so it gets it gets there, right? It means that a lot of people had opportunity and motive. The only one I don't like is when the brother the brothers are in the, the rectory and he says, according to father's will, I can do this. Mm -hmm. I would have been like, A, that would have been read when father's... Norman would have been extremely interested in what he got at the oh, will. Oh, yes. <laughs> so he would have known that clause. Yeah. And then he says, well, you should read the Bible. I'm like, well, you shouldn't kill people. Eventually. Yeah, maybe you should too. <laughs> so the reverend is quick to blame Simeon. So... Lady Felicia finds the body. Mm. His, his head's crushed like an eggshell. 
there's even bone fragments in the ground. Yeah. Like, really? <laughs> Did you have to say that in front of everybody? Yeah. <laughs> Valentine? Valentine is a character that will be defined much better in the future episodes. Mm-hmm. But here he's just... I'm straight out of Dashiell Hammett. He's got the hat. He's the got, trench coat. He's got and the everything. trench coat. Why does he have a trench coat on? It's a June. sunny June afternoon. Because it's part of his costume. Yes. He's gotta, yeah, gotta be serious. Uh, oh. Inspector Valentine, played by Hugo Spear, who was in A Midsummer, not in my backyard. Yes. He is. I think he he's one of my favorite detectives. I like on all the, show. the detectives yeah. on this yeah. show. Yeah, when they change them up, they just they're they're new, but they're good. Yes, yeah. and both brothers are horrible here, uh, horrible, and everyone's pointing the finger at Simeon, and she says, "I did it." The Reverend sees a bus coming, grabs Simeon, and throws him under it. Yeah, and goes, "Look, look, 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 look! He's under the bus! I threw him under the bus!" He's so horrible when he knows he did it. Yeah, the only thing that stops him. At all is Elizabeth saying, I did it. Yeah. So he's perfectly fine with Simeon hanging for his crime, but not Elizabeth. Yeah. I think the Reverend is in love with Elizabeth. Oh, he definitely is. I think he'd find it very convenient if Simeon was put to death Uh, and he had access to Elizabeth. Because he can get married. So, yeah, Yeah. I think so. And he is definitely single. So then he goes, sits on a hill. And Father, things. Father Brown walks the mile up to the hill <laughs> to see him. And he gets there. He's like, oh, how did you get here? He would have seen him coming up the hill. And I said, where's your little bike now, Father Brown? It is one of Father Brown's talents that he is kind of everywhere. Yeah. You know? He is. And, and the, if he's not there, Mrs. M is, though she falls into planters. You always stuff. look for mysteries. Well, yes, because you're clearly the killer. Uh, yeah, I, but I do think it's interesting to know that he already has a reputation as somebody who likes to solve mysteries. He's He already has yep. a reputation as somebody who sticks their nose into things. Yep. The police are aware of him already. They yep. already respect him as somebody who can be useful. Yeah. Uh, so this is not his first rodeo. Yeah. And so then we get the reference here to crosswords and spy novels. Mm-hmm. And we're, we both wondered what spy novel that would be. And it would be Casino Royale. It, certainly. I mean, th- that wasn't the first spy novel ever published, but it would have been, would have been a really most, recent one. And it would have been popular. a big deal. It was a huge book. Yeah, So definitely. So then we see the signed confession and to which I'm like, it says on the bottom of the statement, this signed confession. I'm like, do they have separate pages for confessions and statements? Yeah. I would think it's probably a statement and that that is just an error. That they you just have one pad that's for statements. Oh, I don't know. I don't this know. was the era of forms that you typed on. I would not be surprised. I did if they had witness statements and confessions separate. I did look at the type very closely because I loved typewriters of this period are my wheelhouse. You are super nerdy this episode. I, I am super nerdy. Uh, they talk about the seal of the confession, which I think, you know, I think when the seal of the confessional was written into into uh, Catholic law, I think mystery writers everywhere went, yes! <laughs> <laughs> We now have a thing that we can use all the time. That will be so handy. Now that we can't use mysterious identical twins, we can use the seal of the confessional. Father it's, Brown is really good at never violating it. No, he never does. He sticks to his guns. So always. he says quid pro quo here. Valentine Valentine does. says it. And, and that got me wondering about Vatican II because I was like, when did Vatican II happen? So Vatican II is when... The Roman Catholic Church moved away from Latin. Latin. It's a whole bunch of things, but when they moved away from Latin in their services to English in their services. Didn't which, didn't the priest turn around then too? Yes. And start actually facing the congregation. Which I also assume English Roman Catholic priests took to heart right away. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure, but I would think so. But that was in the 60s. So he would still be doing Latin. Well, and anyone who had any exposure to Catholic school or church would have would know some Latin phrases. Father Brown, seal of the confessional, reads his spy novels, great human being, accepts the evolutionary gay guy, awesome person, breaks the law right here. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> breaks the law. Just goes into Valentine's office goes and riffles his desk. 
Ryan's office and riffles. Well, death. you know, it's for the greater good. Case it's report. not hurting anybody. 6 this is where we get the dates. It's really rare that they put dates on things and we get this such a close look. Did you notice his office kind of looks like a bedroom? Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. I, I think we're supposed to understand that he spends a lot of time there. Yeah. It's not a big police force, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Do we know the name of the village? It's Kimbleford. That's right. There's a sign that I've always Father that. Brown yeah. drives past when he rides his bike. Yes, Kimbleford. Yes. yes. There's men in a barn betting on horses. That speakeasy is just... This is where Simeon's losing his money. So the Hearst Park card is what they talk about, and... It, Hearst Park is a race, race yeah, course. And it goes yeah. from 1890 to 1962. So they definitely, they're listening to it on the radio. Yeah. And there's Jay's disinfectant also in this discussion of Susie. And that that disinfectant is still made and still has that logo. Is it still in concentrate like that? Yep, it is. Because <laughs> it looks like medicine or alcohol. Yeah. It's not in brown black glass bottles, bottles, bottles anymore, yeah. but yeah. So the... The horses that are mentioned are Bride of Frankenstein. Yep. Fluffy Duck. Yep. But Eternal Passion wins. Yes. Which Father think- Brown gets it wrong. He, he doesn't, he, it's not, it's never, both this series and the 74 series, Father Brown never has any mystical line oh, into no. God. No, 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 not at all. The train to London is at 2 p.m. Susie's trying to get away because mm-hmm. she obviously knows that she's going to get blamed. Why does. Norman not try to get it on with her. I think because he sees her as below him. And so humiliating her wouldn't be satisfying. I don't, I don't know. He seems to be full of appetite. So the Smith. And she says he tried and she yeah. shut him down. Yeah. The clock on the wall at the train station is a Smith electric wall clock, which would, that is used in train stations. <laughs> We've talked about. And the Smith's English clocks <laughs> limited has they're not in working anymore but there's a website i'll put in the notes i'm laughing because you're such a nerd the train that comes up oh no is the gwr 6559 class 7903 i'm sorry for mark hall i'm sorry uh it's absolutely (laughs) that train perfect meanwhile i'm like those nuns at the coffee shop sure are nosy. Well, okay, Sarah, <laughs> we have some controversy here, folks. It's not her. But it is meant to look like her. No, she yes. just is wearing the glasses that women of that era in that lifestyle wore. I s- Mark thinks we that one of the, the nuns... We need to get the people who made this show on this show so we can ask them, is that where you got the idea? Is that a precursor? Is that a reference? You're basing that. Okay. Mark thinks that the two nuns that are in the train station, he thinks the one in the glasses is supposed to be a reference to sister Boniface. Cause it looks just like her. Okay. Anybody in a habit looks just like anybody in a habit. And she just happens to have glasses, which sister Boniface also has. So you're saying that two women who are the same outfit and both wear glasses are the same person. That's what you're saying. No, because I, I read through all the credits for this episode to see if Lorna Watson was some production person or anything. They're not Who plays credited. Sister Boniface? Yeah, they're not credited. What are the nuns' names? Uh, what does he call them? Sister Margaret and Sister Mary. What is Sister Boniface's first name? Elizabeth, I think. Neither of them. Okay. Are Elizabeth. Do you need any more proof than that? I just think they got the idea from it. I just think... I think they were familiar with nuns and glasses. Yes. <laughs> it just struck me. Okay. <laughs> Susie oh. tells Father Brown what's going on. Yeah, here. that she caught Norman and Philip together and has been blackmailing him. Gay. But she's been blackmailing him on benefit of the community. Like when he gives her the big 10 pounds and tells her to run off to London and never be seen again. Yeah. Like that's th- not enough money for anybody, no. even with inflation. And I think the writers do such a good job here of making it period appropriate mm-hmm. and yet not making it goofy or funny. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not exaggerated. Also, I do have a problem with this episode that anyone with a brain would immediately know that she is not. I, I want a scene with Father Brown and Valentine where Valentine goes, my hands are tied 
but we both know what's going on here. I think there is kind of that. Kind of. When she um, takes her confession back, it, yeah. he, he's like, I, I know, but I, I can't do anything. He makes a reference to the courts of Assize. Assizes. Yes. There are periodic courts that are held around England and Wales until 1972. Basically, they didn't have enough courts. For They're everybody. traveling courts. Yeah. They travel around like they did this in the Old West, too. The judge would come to town once a month and do all the courts. It was much easier for the judge to move around. Than, than to bring all the bad bring, people yeah. to a central court in which they might get away during transportation. Yep. And then we have this great scene, which I think is really important to the writers in this episode. Because they change what happens in this episode. In the story and in the 1974 show, the... Norman is killed for a different reason mm -hmm. than here. And I think this moment at the pond is the central moment of this episode where he says, I'm terrified. Yeah. And Father Brown basically says, your secret's safe with me and I really kind of don't care. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find out why this man got killed. Mm -hmm. Because in the original, Norman is bad. Well, the Reverend is mad at him enough to kill him because he takes advantage of somebody who's intellectually disabled. Yeah, right. that's it. That's his big mean thing. Yeah. But in this version, the Reverend is angry enough to kill him because he knows that he's having some kind of sex with Philip in the garden shack in the cemetery. Well, and, and I was going to get this in the end, but we can talk about this now. In this version, he throws that hammer with the intention of killing his brother. Yeah. While in the story and the first version, in the he kind of says, I dropped this hammer and God made it go I, to kill him. I dropped it. It could have fallen on the ground, could but it fallen. didn't. And it was because God drove it to his head. And <laughs> why I think this scene is important and why he's a bug guy mm -hmm. is because that original Why Philip story, is an entomologist. Yeah. Norman is has this helmet on and his brother says it was just like the hammer hit this green bug, this green beetle. Oh, it killed him even though he had a helmet on. So why was he wearing a helmet? Because I don't in the I, original. I, you know? I forget. OK, but I think that's why he's a bug guy here. I think it's kind of a reach, but I'll go with it. So I'll let you have it. OK. The the other thing, it's uh, if you've never watched Father Brown before, that there's this little twist that happens at the end of every episode when when Father Brown confronts the criminal when he says, "I know you did it." Yes. Right? Consistently, he says, "I know you did it, but you can repent." Yes. You're still going to go to prison. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you can get away with this, but more importantly. You have to confess to God. Yes. You have to save your soul because yes. you are going to go to prison, but your soul is not irredeemable. And some people like that he does that. And some people dislike that he does that. And he does that consistently. No matter how bad the criminal is, no matter how nasty they are, he always offers to hear their confession yep. and to help them save their soul. He says the truth is what's important, not who did it or jail or mm -hmm. anything. It's the truth. Father Brown confronts him up the tower. He uh, he makes a motion to jump off, and Father Brown convinces him not to do that. But the Rev is not sorry. No, the Rev is not sorry. He says it was guided by God. I didn't do it. Yeah. God did it. God did All it. I did was throw the hammer. And Father Brown <laughs> does the perfect mad Father Brown here. Yeah. Where he goes, don't let God be your scapegoat. And it's, like, it's very much a how dare you. It, wow. Which, whether you believe in God or not, is really satisfying. Yeah. He's like, you are not going to get away with that. With that excuse, it doesn't fly with me or with anybody else. But the Rev has a career that he's missing here. Yeah. He is the luckiest shot in the entire oh world. God. Okay, folks, I went outside of our house. We have a deck and <laughs> I have a hammer that I use to help split wood and stuff in the backyard. And I threw the hammer from the deck and I'm like, no way are you hitting anything. Certainly not something 50 feet away. How many experiments do you do off our back deck? You've dropped <laughs> knives off of there. Now you're throwing hammers off the back deck. Never mind. Norman is not like underneath him. No. He's 20, 30 feet away from the church wall. He's got to throw it out. In the 74 show and the story, he's right beside the church. Yeah. He basically he just, just drops, drops it, it off the edge. Yeah. But this one. It's like. 
It, it, he, yeah. He, he needs a little, like, laser pointer like, on. Did, 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 locked on. Yep. Did you feel it? Oh, yeah. Like, man, it would hurt. And they do this great shot where he falls down just as Lady Felicia goes outside. Yeah. And, like, I really like that shot. I think they did that. That was a nice She setup. was just at the door, and the Reverend couldn't know that she was just at the door. Yeah. And then she went in. Yeah. He throws the hammer and she comes back. Yeah. She could have easily seen the hammer fly. Yeah, she could have. Easily. And if she did, they would have known exactly who did it right then and there. Yep. Let's talk about the title for a second. Okay. Hammer of God. Because the Rev says God did it. Yes. Right? I was just his his instrument. God did it. God made me go to the blacksmith shop to get it. To borrow a hammer to fix the clock. To yeah, throw my brother. like he was going to fix the clock. So is God's hammer the hammer? Does the reverend see himself as God's hammer? So this is a long Or period. is Father Brown the real hammer of God? Because, the, so there's a long tradition of people being objects of God. The sword of God. The right hand. The right whatever. hand of God. You know, that that is a well-known tradition that is not Christian-based, right? So It's not exclusive to Christianity. But hammer is a modern thing. Nope. It's no, in the it's Bible. Not. It's in the I looked for the word hammer in the Bible. Oh, it's all over the place. It's all about gold in the Bible. No. God God says ugh, I wish I'd written it down. I'm not a biblical scholar, okay? okay. But he, he says, Am I not a hammer that I like break up the hearts of men who are like stone yes, to me? Th- and like, that's a new that's a New Testament reference, I think, where you're talking about. Okay, but that was written well before this. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's so, not like a modern thing. Well, no, <laughs> that I think is what you're referencing if you say Father Brown's the hammer of God. Yeah, like yeah. he's like he is the symbol of righteousness. Yes. And of smiting. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't like throw the reverend off the roof or anything. No. But he's definitely not going to let him get away with this. No. You know, he's going to definitely turn him in if he doesn't turn himself in for sure. Yeah. Susie has made a dish. She yes. made a dish for the extravaganza. Yes, and it's not really talked about. The name of it doesn't appear in the subtitles very well. It, it doesn't appear at all. No, they kind of just go, oh, never mind. What she, and, <laughs> and, I, and I'll tell you that uh, the actress who plays Susie, Kasia Koletsek, is yeah. Polish. Yes. She's actually Polish. When Father Brown tastes it at the extravaganza, it's clear that it's like a spaghetti Thing. It's like a noodley thing. Like a noodley, like a cold noodle salad kind of thing, right? It doesn't go with strawberry scones. Well, there's a, it, there's a selection of things. It's a pitch-in. People bring what they want. But what Susie I calls gotta it. I got to tell you, we got to eat more before I do this podcast. My <laughs> stomach's like rumbling. What Susie calls it then, and it's very quick, sounds something like grossis makim. Yeah. Something like that, yeah. right? And I'm like, I got to know what this is. I looked all over the place, right? This is your rabbit hole. And then I found a board of people who are Polish, Polish American, discussing all kinds of things. And one of the things that somebody asked about is this dish. In this scene. In this scene specifically is what they're talking about. And these are people who clearly know what they're talking about. I skimmed around other threads. They know what they're talking about. And what they say is they think what she's actually made is something called kluski kladzioni or kladzion. I can't. Yep. Or kluski slaski. And kluski is like noodle. Okay. Or dumpling. Okay. Kluski slaski is potato dumplings. Okay. That are sort of like noodles. Okay. But Kluski Kladzioni is probably closer because they're noodles that you sort of drop into boiling water. Okay. So they're like a, uh, almost like a batter okay. that you drop into and it forms into noodles. And that would be more spaghetti like. Yeah. But then I went a little bit further because I'm like, no, it looks like pasta. It you're looks making, like spaghetti. You're making the face. I'm a little worried here. And I found this very well known Polish pasta dish. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that people around the world can't eat their own stuff and that I have to like it. You know, whatever you like, fine, great. And I also know that a lot of recipes, traditional recipes, originate out of not having a whole lot to put together. You know, 
you don't have everything to choose from. You make do with what you have. So a lot of traditional recipes are born out of necessity, but I don't think there's any explanation for this one. Are you ready? Okay. This is a well-known po- Polish pasta dish. Okay. It is pasta with strawberry no, sauce. Not, okay. We're not making fun of Polish people or their food. It is pasta with strawberry sauce. But, but this dish is not good. <laughs> it is like ziti with a sauce made from strawberries. Is it served cold or warm? The pasta is warm. The sauce is cold. Oh. It you is gotta, made, you gotta, you gotta okay, know Stop. You gotta listen. Okay. It's made okay. with strawberries. Okay. Sour cream. Oh. Honey and vanilla. Oh, that's okay. And that's over pasta. Yeah, it doesn't need it's, to be. A, should be over ice cream. It's dessert pasta. Yeah, it's dessert I pasta. I just can't. Oh. I, I'm glad they like it. Hey, if you like it, great. Convince me. Yeah. Somebody convince me if you've had it. Yes. It sounds like ruining two good dishes. Like you could just have the pasta and you yeah. could have that strawberry sauce on just about anything. Yes. A scone. Yeah. Toast. Yes. Really would be better. Yes. <laughs> Why, why would you put it why on noodles? Do, why would you do that? I can't think of a single dessert made with pasta. No, I don't like cold food, so. Well, that's your problem. Yeah. Anyhow. That is hammer of God. Let me tell you one more thing before we go. Okay. That is funny. So I'm looking into cassocks, right? Because what I wanted to know, I had such a stupid question. Father Brown's cassock has a whole bunch of buttons on the front. Yes. Do you I, think he wears pants under that? He definitely does. It covers up the screwdriver of, of God. <laughs> Mark Williams's butt, which we saw in the other thing. Yeah. I want to know whether there are real buttons because what a hassle. Yeah. Right? That's a lot of buttons. It's a lot of buttons. There are wedding dresses that have little satin buttons down the back and there's underneath is a fake, zipper. Yeah. There's right? lots of fake buttons. Yeah. Stuff. I mean, so I wanted to know. So I go looking around to see if in the 50s, cassocks would have had real buttons. Yeah. And I find out that they have this thing called, uh, they call it like a Chesterfield front. Yes. Where they're fake buttons and yeah. underneath there are buttons but they're bigger and there's fewer of them oh, okay. like under a fly yeah right i find this great description on wikipedia explaining that th- for ease of use they did this with the buttons right and then the next link i go to is on amazon yeah for a cassock that you can buy yeah that isn't a costume it's not a cheap cassock it's being sold by an ecumenical costume uh, an ecumenical equipment company yes. okay they sell serious stuff they including yeah. a black wool cassock Yes. I read the description. It sounds familiar. I go back to Wikipedia. It's the same text on both (laughs) pages. So either Wikipedia has stolen a description from an Amazon page or the cassock company copied and pasted Wikipedia for their Amazon page. Wow. That is it. I want to know the answer. There's no reference on either one. Like, oh, and we stole this from Wikipedia or this is copied from a cassock description. And it's it's not very good. That's weird. And it's not very well written either. So they both made bad choices. Anyhow, yes. he didn't have to button all those buttons. There's probably just a few buttons underneath it. Oh, you old Irish woman. Yeah, Mrs. M learns to make the recipe that we don't know. Yeah. Susie tries it. A lot of people say, and I don't know this for sure, if you're Catholic or you were raised Catholic or have experience with this, you can let us know that you're not supposed to eat before you take communion. Yeah. And so Susie tasting it on the way into church is kind of a big deal. Because either... She's making a a pretty big mistake that she's eating something or she knows she shouldn't and she's eating it anyway to be to nice. show goodwill yeah. towards Mrs. M. All I kept thinking was this is what life was like before Tupperware. Yes. That you had to have a bowl with a cloth on it to take food to a party. She sticks Very, her fingers right yeah. in the bowl. That, my friends, is Hammer of God. Yep, we don't have... Our a, introduction to Father Brown. We don't have a best corpse because we just got There's one. only the one. What about after the credits? Ah, uh, I think Elizabeth and Simeon are going to be just fine. I, I think, don't know who's going to take over the Bohan estate when one brother's dead and the other one's going to prison. Maybe yeah. they have a sister who's decent and Maybe can take over. She should be taking all the monies. I think Philip, our... Uh, and, at an entomologist is going to be just fine. Hope he finds a nice man in London. Yeah. Yep. That's it. Okay. I don't have a horrible movie for you this time. All these people, all these actors have made good choices. Yes. About you, what they're going to appear in. <laughs> you can find. You can find us everywhere. Yes. 
on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email, all that good stuff. Again, we're still taking off on Instagram. It's, What's our next Father Brown? Our next Father Brown is season one, episode six, which is The Eye of Apollo. Oh, it's a good one. It's a very, very good episode. We always have to do the first one. Not that the first episode's bad. Hammer no, of God is a, is a good episode. I, they do so many things right in this episode. I remember when we saw it, we first were like, Father Brown! Yeah. And it's not a potato vision! Yeah. Yes! Yes! And then we saw it was Mark Williams, and we're, we're like, like yes, yes! Yes! He's awesome. And then we watched that first episode, and we were like, oh, we got to watch another one This right is going to be good. Yeah, yeah, this is going to be good. So the next one we're going to do is episode six of this season. Feel yes. free to watch all the ones in between if you haven't. Yes seen them for the sure eye but if Apollo. you can't and you skip right to episode six you will be fine yeah they're very good at not um relying on each episode in order if, if you worry about continuity with these episodes you got to watch the first and the last episode of each season because that's where any real changes the big take story place. arcs happen yep. like characters come and go and things like that, that but only otherwise happens you're in fine the first and last episodes yeah. so all right so until next time Bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs. Your mother makes scones in hell. I did notice the big blue gay hut of love. I th- that that was interesting. It's green. Is it is it green? It's a green gardener's hut. Yes. <laughs> it's the the gay green hut of love. The great if green. that's what you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs>